Hey everyone, and welcome to today's Protocol Labs Research Seminar. Today we are joined by Sabah Kedemilitis and Kash Nurozi, um, who are both from crowdfunded cures. Uh, Sabah conducted his master's thesis on uh, alternatives to the patent system to incentivize the development of medicines uh, and founded the charity Crowdfunded Cures in 2013. This was to help implement and scale these ideas as a social enterprise and a DSI project. Cash is an engineer with Crowdfunded Cures who works with Saba and will run through the systems diagrams for the smart contract of the medical prize funds and impact market for public medicines. Crowdfunded Cure's mission is to use financially innovative pay for success contracts or social impact bonds, medical impact NFTs, IP NFTs, and hypersets to create impact market for clinical trial data, validating the safety and efficiency of unmonopolizable public goods, medical therapies. Um, over to you, Sabah. Thanks so much. Yeah, a lot of um, tongue twisters in there. Um, so you did great. <laughs> so as as, uh, as Liam was saying, so um, uh, we're going to be talking about impact markets for public good medicines. Uh, we're also, yeah, we've been working with protocol labs uh, on, on their hypersuits framework. So really excited. Uh, with uh, Cash, hopefully, will um, he's in a call, but he'll he can hopefully demo some of the stuff we've built around um, this uh, basically proposed impact mark to fund um, what we call unmonopolizable therapies. And I'm going to go through uh, a lot of these things and talk about the IP side of things, and um, also a little bit about how drugs are made and 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 um, the kind of commercial. Um, uh, issues and market failures around uh, drug development. So yeah, the first thing is um, uh, there's these diagrams, people might be familiar with the one on the right, uh, it's called Eroom's Law. And also uh, on the left, uh, basically uh, health expenditure is just going through the roof. It's um, increasing exponentially uh, kind of, uh, you know, with aging baby boom population. Also at the same time, um, drugs are becoming more and more expensive. Uh, pharma productivity essentially is going down, becoming more and more expensive over the t over time. And um, part of our thesis and what we think is a lot of this actually is to do with uh, market failures. We're basically... The problem with um, drugs is that uh, you, uh, the, in order to make money from drugs, um, in order for pharmaceutical companies to make money from drugs, they need a patent uh, in place. Because what happens is as soon as a patent runs out over a drug, uh, that means anyone can make it. And typically, you know, these, these drugs are basically like industrial chemicals. They're not expensive to make, at least when things are working properly. Um, and the drug basically goes off this thing called a patent cliff. So initially, uh, a drug is quite expensive. It might be, say, $50 a pill. And then um, the patent runs out usually around 10 years after it's been on the market. And it basically basically just crashes in price and goes to almost like marginal price. So this thing is because it's so drastic and because the financial outcomes are so drastic, it's called a patent cliff. Essentially, the, the profitability as an innovator, as a person that, that basically spent the billion dollars or whatever to make this new drug or paid for all the clinical trials, um, all of a sudden, there, there's no more um, private incentives to do this sort of research. So um, patents are this massive um, uh, problem, uh, incentive, finance, incentive, uh, uh, basically, uh, the, the pharmaceutical industry relies on patents to in order to make their money back. This has a number of problems. The main one is that we've got incentives in patent law, that patents are placed before patients. You have uh the most patentable drugs being developed, but not necessarily the safest drugs. So, um, you know, a good example, say, for instance, is the opioid crisis. There was a patent to say that the, the drugs, these opiates could be taken at, um, at 12 hours apart. And, and actually the science didn't back it up, but or at least but the marketing, they wanted the marketing to basically say that we could take these drugs 12 hours apart. And it created this uh, massive basically cycle of, of addiction because the drugs would sort of stop working after about eight hours and then you'd end up taking more and then you'd end up sort of getting into the cycle of addiction. So that's what this particular um, article in Nature talked about, is that patents, essentially, the most patentable drugs are being developed, but not necessarily the, the, the drugs that are best for patients. And there's this also this invisible uh, tragedy of the commons. Um, so you've got um, essentially drugs that could be very safe, could be very effective, are being um, uh, screened out of um, development. 
because at a very early stage because um, a patent cannot be enforced. So essentially, um, it's this invisible problem caused by um, uh, financial incentives uh, being focused so much on patents where a patent is essentially the most uh, important ingredient of a drug and it doesn't really matter if your um if your drug uh, is you know could treat some disease or cure some disease if you can't enforce a monopoly price then it doesn't get funded so there are these missing incentives basically where pharmaceutical companies are not going to pay for a large phase two phase three clinical trials these typically cost tens of millions of dollars if they can't enforce a monopoly price to make their money back um, and, you know, I don't blame pharmaceutical companies for, for not funding them. And also, um, as we'll talk about later, um, governments uh, don't and charities don't want to pay sort of tens of millions of dollars either because drug development is extremely high risk, extremely expensive, and they don't want to take on that risk. Um, they would rather have a private company taking on that risk. Um, but without uh, a patent incentive, nobody funds these clinical trials. So there's these missing incentives. And 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 basically, yeah, these uh, large uh, phase two, phase three clinical trials are extremely um, important. Um, they're uh, because that's what doctors use to make decisions as to whether um, they're going to prescribe this drug to patients. They can prescribe things off label, but they don't want to do it. And um, you know, they're taking on a lot of risk. So you need data, and also governments and health insurers are not going to reimburse the cost of those drugs unless there's large randomized controlled trials. So there's this kind of market failure. Um, and that's what we said is that basically it's to do with um, new drugs, extremely uh, expensive to reduce, you know, you may be paying sort of $3 billion and it could take up to 15 years. However, a repurposed drug, you know, might only cost $30 million. Um, so this is an existing drug where you find a, you get an existing drug and you can actually find new uses for existing drugs. And those things um, might actually uh be very effective to treat uh, another um, disease. However, if, if it's not, if they're not paid in it, there's no private financial incentives. But we could potentially get these things to market like a lot sooner. Um, you know, sometimes maybe one year or three years. Um, uh, you know, one year is probably a bit fast. But but the FDA, particularly for um, things for unmet medical needs, is is keen to push things through. And there's just so many drugs out there that could be repurposed, but there's no private incentives. One of the core issues is around the idea that 90% of the drugs out there are actually off patent. And as I was saying, if the drug is off patent, then there's um, no private financial incentives to find new uses of those drugs. Um, and then um, uh, because basically you, you can't enforce a monopoly price, you can't, you can't stop people from taking the old drug for the for your patent to do so if you found out that aspirin was extremely effective to treat cancer you can't sue the entire planet that takes aspirin you can't stop them from accessing aspirin or whatever they can just buy it from their pharmacy a lot of drugs you can just order them off amazon order them off online or or you can ask your doctor to prescribe them to you and they will and you can't go around suing doctors so essentially finding new uses for off patent drugs is just data it's information and information is essentially a something that everyone can take advantage of as a non-rivalrous and non-excludable public good. So we're talking essentially about a public goods problem. And, and we all, you know, in crypto, we're all very interested in, in solving these public goods problems. And so there's also really um, the interesting thing with this is there's a massive commercial opportunity here. Um, because there's literally trillions of dollars from of health sa uh, savings available from using really low cost generic drugs because these things are so cheap it doesn't cost a lot of money to to treat patients with off patent drugs they're very cheap but the the, the expensive part is doing the clinical trials um so as i was saying there's a massive opportunity here um i sorry uh and uh so it's ten thousand uh generic drugs or say maybe seven and a half thousand but, but a lot of generic drugs actually thousands and thousands of them but with no private financial incentives to do this sort of research um you know, there's a lot more than patented drugs. You know, patented drugs are a small minority of the, the, the whole number of drugs out there. And there's even more um, nutraceuticals, basically. So these things are like um, supplements and even things like plant medicines and what they call medicinal mushrooms, things like that. Um, so there's, there's just a lot of these uh, chemicals out there, but they're extremely uh, cheap to obtain. Sometimes you can grow them. Um, so again, no... Um, no means of of capturing these uh, uh, this market opportunity. 
you know, we're just going to talk about a few of these off patent drugs because there's some real science behind them. They're not like we're not talking about uh, something that's, uh, you know, science fiction or anything. So oxyphenobutazone can treat uh, drug resistant tuberculosis, basically an NSAID. It's a, it's a um, like a pain, uh, it was an old pain relief from the 50s uh, that, that could be used. Uh, Low dose naltrexone to treat chronic pain. Uh, Clomipramine to treat brain tumors. These things are off patent drugs and then they're making statements and they're saying that, you know, according to researchers, pharmaceutical firms will not fund this research since the drug is already off patent. So there's just this lack of incentive to fund, you know, things for very serious things like brain cancer. Simvastatin for multiple sclerosis. Again, simvastatin is another statin. It could be used, um, it's off patent, it could be very effective. Multiple sclerosis, which otherwise costs um, governments and health insurers billions and billions of dollars. Uh, we can talk about uh, Tecfidera, which is actually was an industrial chemical, but it's been charged out. I think it makes over a billion dollars a year. Um, because a pharma, pharma companies managed to take the uh, generic version off the market and then so they could only be the ones that supplied Tecfidera. Um, but there are other drugs potentially that could be um, used to treat MS. Tetrothiamolybdate is this really cheap um, drug that it's called a copitulation agent and apparently it can uh, reduce uh, recurrence of breast cancer um, by 20% or the, along those lines, so maybe 10, 20%. Um, and, it, you know, that could lead to 15,000 um, fewer uh, cancer diagnoses and and uh, significant cost savings sort of in the, in the, in the hundreds or um, hundreds of millions. Mm -hmm. Uh, BCG vaccine to treat uh, type 1 diabetes. Um, it's also, uh, so basically BCG vaccine was one of the first uh, vaccines made. It's There's also evidence that people that have had this vaccine have got lower incidence of respiratory illness generally. Um, so uh, we're working, well, we've been talking with Open Source Pharma Foundation about potentially using BCG vaccine as something like a universal vaccine, what they call like an open vax. Um, and that can reduce incident of, of, of respiratory illnesses like COVID up to 80%. So again, billion dollar, multiple billion dollar opportunity, but no financial incentives to pay for those clinical trials because BCG vaccine costs cents in the dollar. And we've got a dechloroacetate um, that got a little bit of press um, uh, for treating uh, neuroblastoma. And people were ordering it offline and things off Amazon, but again, no private incentives to do clinical trials and public money usually is very hard to obtain, um, very hard to get grants and extremely hard to, to convince um, someone, uh, public or like a, like a, a government or a, a charity to pay for a large clinical trial. Um, vitamin C also um, pretty uh, important um, for um, yeah, can treat a bunch of different cancers. Um, there's some real science behind this. It's actually from my hometown of Christchurch. Uh, a lady, uh, Marguerite Fiss, is one of the world's sort of leading experts on use of high dose IV vitamin C. It has in the past been seen as a little bit of quack medicine, but actually there's a lot of real science behind that. And again, um, sort of the statements there that you can see vitamin C is not patentable. No financial incentive for pharmaceutical companies to support vitamin C clinical trials. Those have been done largely relied on public grants and private donations, which is not really scalable. Uh, fluvoxamine to uh, treat COVID. So you probably all heard about um, ivermectin and um, hydroxychloroquine and things like that. This one has actually been shown to be quite effective in like a uh, phase three uh, clinical trial in Brazil. Unfortunately, it did not get FDA approval because that clinical trial had, it was just the, the FDA didn't accept it. And, um, you know, it was publicly funded essentially that's the other thing is the clinical trials in brazil are quite cheap but i think the fda essentially is not um, keen on on uh, accepting things based on clinical trial data that's outside the united states and which is quite expensive um, so this is primarily a financial issue a market failure uh, so one of the other areas is around psychedelics plant-based medicine so something like cannabis um, it could be used to treat chronic pain, reduce um, uh, reliance on opiates. Um, so we spoke about opiates before. That's a massive problem in the States. It's going to kind of cost, cost over a trillion dollars a year. So there's massive um, financial um, uh, financial opportunity, uh, or at least cost savings available, um, 
but no way, no market, no way for people to basically pay for those cost savings or capture those cost savings, and turn that into a, a scalable market. Um, psilocybin, same sort of thing. Um, you know, you can grow it um, very cheap um, and it has very rapid uh, sustained antidepressant effects. It's been shown, um, it's been researched. So, but there is no, uh, again, no private incentives to do clinical trials for psilocybin because essentially you can't enforce a monopoly price. Uh, there was a company, there is a company called Compass Pathways that's doing a tweaked version of psilocybin, which they call Polymorph A. However, if the off-patent version of psilocybin is basically the same efficacy as Polymorph A, they're going to have a real trouble enforcing a monopoly price for that, or at least um, they're going to be, particularly when psilocybin becomes um, it becomes legal, and I think it's likely to become legal um, next few years, they'll, they'll find that uh, it's going to be very difficult for them, again, to, to sort of stop people taking it off-label or going to clinics where they'll prescribe off-label. Uh, ketamine is another really... Uh, uh, an interesting one it sort of shows the the, the perverse incentives under the current system so um uh, it's very cheap it's very effective to treat um uh, treatment resistant depression works very fast like it's one of the latest drugs out there it's one of the the latest drugs that have been shown shown a new um, mechanism of action um and uh to treat depression uh by by attaching to to, to glutamate i believe um but uh very cheap so but what happened johnson and johnson created a tweaked version which they call s ketamine it's the left-handed side version of molecule and they're charging twelve thousand dollars of course for that um the off-patent ketamine is 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 much much cheaper you know ten dollars they say of course and also, ironically, as I was saying before, that the, the off-patent version has been shown to be safer, uh, best in class, potentially, like uh, than S-ketamine. So it's another example of patent incentives basically actively uh, leading to uh, inferior, potentially inferior um, drugs being, um, being um, prescribed to patients. There's also longevity. If you're really into longevity, um, most basically all of the, the longevity research and all the longevity drugs uh, out there that, that has the most evidence are off patent drugs. So things like um, rapamycin, uh, NAD, uh, NMN, um, metformin, vitamin D, NM, um, these things are all off patent drugs. So, um, you know, and we might be sort of 10, 15 years away before we get a, a patented longevity drug. And these off patent longevity drugs might be very effective. They might sort of increase lifespan by 20% or something and, and some sort of combination and, and be very safe. We know exactly how safe and effective they are because they've been used for kind of 20, 20 years plus, uh, some of them maybe even longer, um, and uh, but there's no private incentives, again, to uh, do the clinical trials because these things are essentially public good medicines. You know, we've got a solution. Uh, so it's essentially uh, retroactive public goods funding. Um, you guys might have heard of this. So Vitalik uh, talks about it and, and the people from Optimism. Um, and the idea essentially of impact markets is a retroactive public goods fund. So the idea is that you find someone that we call a success payer or you could call it a retroactive funder or a funder um, that agrees to uh, purchase essentially successful clinical trial data. Um, and then on the basis of that agreement, now you have a market for investors to go in and fund, uh, uh, impact investors to go in and fund clinical trials. Now, this could be done off chain. As you can see, it's quite simple. Like you just need a payer, like, and that could be uh, ideally, that should be like a government or a health insurer. Mm -hmm. People that are basically paying like tens of billions, if not hundreds mm -hmm. of billions, actually, they, they, they pay around $500 billion a year in monopoly uh, price drugs. They could potentially save, you know, billions and billions of dollars if you could come up with a very cheap um, off-patent drug that might even be better than the patented drug. So that sort of creates uh, that's that's a great incentive for for a payer to basically, you know, maybe pay you a hundred million dollars for uh, the data, the information that that proves that this off-patent drug is very effective. So that's what creates a market for for um, for data. And so there are these advantages. Um, also, um, you might say, okay, well, why don't why don't we just get all the, the government? Why don't we just get the government to 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 
do to pay for these like the NIH to do uh, directly fund the clinical trials. The problem with this is like any kind of, anyone that understands like where the government is involved in these massive expensive projects, they usually turn into these big white elephants where they just spend, you know, they might spend tens or hundreds of millions of dollars dollars on on um, research that doesn't work. And um, it's because it's centralized. Government doesn't necessarily know how to pick the winners, but with this uh, pay for success model, you're creating a market and then um, uh, there's a risk transfer from say, from wherever the payers are onto the, the um, onto, onto the market who is more willing to take risks uh, and fail fast. Technology, also pharma um, and, and the biotech industry have, have the best people, they've got the best technology, um, you know, the best R&D, and they're incentivized to basically do that. Uh, also, free market, is, as we, you know, some might disagree, but it's very, as long as the incentives are right, it's very efficient at allocating resources and failing quickly. Um, and also low costs. So repurposed generic drugs potentially could outcompete uh, patented drugs because essentially, uh, the the payers, whoever is paying for them, they might pay like fifty thousand dollars per quality, quality, like what they call a quality is quality adjusted life year. That's how much usually that's how usually payers figure out how much they want to pay for drugs. But using these impact markets, you get much lower cost per quality, maybe even a hundredth of the cost. Uh, so we think this, yeah, the future of NFTs, basically, you could use them to fund public good medicines. You know, we've, we've got um, Board App Yacht Club or, you know, $3 billion uh, market cap. You've got people raising $50 million, you know, $150 million to, to buy a copy of the Constitution. What if they could put their money into um, funding public good medicines, um, pre-purchasing public good medicines, where there's they're de-risked, they're only going to pay for successful clinical trials. And that's what um, basically we think is, is a way to uh, create these impact markets we need and to create a market for retroactive funding. We're proposing open source pharma IP NFTs. So these are basically things that once you've got the retroactive funding, then you get investors to invest in the clinical trials. And these things are essentially hyper certs um, and they allow fractionalization of ownership uh, and uh, basically ownership of clinical trial data around a particular treatment protocol. Let's say, you know, you, you work out this off patent drug is really great for treating cancer. Um, you can create an, you know, and you think it's going to be really good. You can, you can mint this open source farmer IP NFT to allow fractionalization to raise a few million dollars um, to do the clinical trials. And then these open source farmer NFTs are the ones that create the actual market for the retroactive public goods funding. Then there's a question of like, how are we going to allocate that retroactive public goods funding to the owners of the IP NFTs that are successful? And Cyrus is going to be the one running through that sort of uh, that flow. But um, uh, we've got essentially this medical impact DAO. And what happens is it's based on uh, this thing that I did for my thesis called the, um, uh, that I was relying on for my thesis. Uh, it's done by another um, a couple of uh, academics, um, Aidan Hollis and Thomas Boggy. Um, it was called the Medical Impact Fund. Um, and this is a medical impact DAO. And basically we've got the crowdfunding that comes in, we've got a big prize fund, and then 20% say of the prize fund or a fixed amount of that prize fund is payable every year to successful clinical trials. Um, and what happens is you have IP NFTs, which are minted to raise money for the clinical trials. And if they're successful, they turn into hyper certs, having a number of impact points. And the number of impact points is determined um, because these clinical trials are very formalized, you can compare them you can say uh, the clinical trial is a randomized control trial where you treat, uh, where you compare your off patent drug versus usual care. And then if your off patent drug is 50% better than usual care, then you get 50 impact points. And that's that determines how long you can be registered, how much you get of the, the, the prize fund is, is, is distributed proportionally. 20% of it is distributed proportionally every year between those um, uh, proportional to impact points. And also, um, after a while, the impact points get um, get deregistered, basically, um, say five years, and then that increases proportionally the amount of clinical trials that might um, uh, that that, uh, that the might of money that might be available. And the idea is that uh, after a while, is this kind of uh, equilibrium that's reached, where basically impact investors get um, 
around 10% return on their investments. So they do the MPV, they, they, they like work out the, the net present value of, of the chance that if they fund, if they put in a million dollars for this clinical trial, what's the chance that I'm going to make 10% return on my investment? And then they'll look at the money that's available from uh the, the outcome payments from the prize and then they'll they'll decide whether they want to fund it or they want to register or not so the, basically this market equilibrium is reached automatically and what we want is just everyone to basically put their money in the top funnel and that will automatically allocate it to the uh, people on the bottom funnel and um I'm just and also we've got yeah we've got Cyrus and he's um uh, he's going to basically run through this and demonstrate it, but it's a de-risking mechanism. And the idea I'll just uh, mention in the next slide, the idea is once we've got an optimal treatment protocol, say for an off-patent drug, um, then we would negotiate what's called an advanced mark commitment with payers, like say health insurers and governments to get the funding to get this through to FDA approval. And so where they basically agree, we'll pay you $100 million if you can get this uh, drug through and get it to FDA approval on the base that will save like $200 million or more. So we're happy to do that. And it's the same sort of prize mechanism. But initially, we want to do this de-risking thing. And that's where I will um, pass it on to Cyrus, our, um, our wonderful dev. Hello, everyone. My name is Cyrus. I'm excited to uh, take you all through what we've got over here in Protocol Labs Research. I want to draw to attention the example of an elephant. Okay, and maybe you all have seen this graphic before, but here's an elephant. And there's like seven different blindfolded people around it. And one of them is touching the trunk and then the other is touching like the legs and the other is touching the ears. And they're all being like, oh, this is a different thing. And so what I'm going to present is the, the elephant. And depending on which stakeholder you are, you're going to have a different experience of this elephant. I want to build up our knowledge really quickly about some of the concepts we're going to use here. The first concept I want to look at is a capital flow. So if you've ever used Superfluid or Drips Network, you know what this is about. You have a source of funds, then you decide to flow a dollar per second for a year to a receiver. Cool. That makes sense. Amazing. And then, of course, we can compose these. We can have splitters and have flows go to different nodes. Great. And this is this is our like uh, our are primitive in a sense. This is the this capital flow is a primitive. We're working with Drips Network specifically. They have had a protocol on mainnet since January. They're the devs behind uh, Radical. Radical being quite a radical take on open source software. And so upon Drips Network, we're building out two specific, let's say, DAOify primitives to support us and what we're trying to do. So the first primitive we're calling a prize pool. And a prize pool, you can imagine, is adjusting the flow by passing through X percent. So you have a source, you put in like a million dollars or $10,000. This prize pool is configured to only flow through 20%. And so the receiver only gets 20% of this. That's the first primitive. This is a, a, a flow adjuster. And then we have uh, impact splitters, which, as alluded to by Saba earlier, they will, they will split the inflow pro rata to the number of points that are assigned to different receivers. And you have an agent that administrates this. So these are two generalizable mechanisms. We can compose them, layer them however we want. Um, and even, and just to Sava's point earlier, an advanced marketed commitment and a pay for success uh, prize pool are the same thing. And so what you're seeing now as a mechanism can be used for us to first set the table and validate and legitimize and through research and randomized controlled trials, these, uh, these off patent, uh, this off patent medicine. And then this mechanism can get then used to onboard large payers onto, um, onto what it is that we're doing, the impact that we're trying to make in the world. So there's this, there's also IP NFTs, um, I imagine a lot of people here are familiar with IP NFTs and hyper certs. So you can imagine they're very similar, actually. A hyper -cert certifying a certain impact can be, it can, is one potential use case for an IP NFT. And so as we're going through the system, I'm going to go through, I want us to take the perspective of a system designer, of a somebody who's interested in public goods and financing public goods and doing good for the world, make, making sure that their dollars are well spent 
and not spent on bullshit, not spent on things that doesn't doesn't turn out to work. And so this is the top half of the chart. This is so far the uh, pay for success model. So you can imagine there's a treasury for a DAO and the DAO has capital that it can then put into a general price pool. And then 20% of that flows to this DAO impact splitter. And there's the DAO members through some governance mechanism can assign impact points like seven points or five points to different specific prize pools, different disease classes. So I went over nine or 10 of them. And so what I'm showing you is how it is a simplified model of this, uh, of our system that can scale because these splitters, you know, you can just add more receivers to the splitter and, uh, what ideally this looks like in a year or two with multiple different things set up. Now uh, we we have to play charades. We have to play. We have to run a scene in the DAO space, right? We have to get the right agents to make the right decisions. And so this system, as architected, supports that. And we can initially start off with one specific prize pool, for example, or just one general prize pool connected to one specific prize pool. And that's that's more focused for a go-to-market strategy, but naturally the system extends and it doesn't require uh, any, any code changes or whatever. Just deploy some more contracts, you know. So you have the DAO impact splitter, and we're letting DAO members uh, assign points to specific disease classes. We can imagine there's uh, different governance structures we can ex experiment with here. There could be quadratic funding, quadratic voting. There could be uh, regular simple voting too, which could be really useful when there's only a few impact splitters going on, a few things to split to. And, um, you know, there's capital that can flow into any of these nodes Okay, so we could run a general NFT series, and then this flows capital directly to the general price pool. We could do a specific NFT series for psychedelic impact, and it'll flow capital directly to the open psychedelic price pool for major depressive disorder. And uh, health insurers and governments can also fit into any of the system if they want to look good. So, and different agents can permissionlessly come and start flowing capital to specific areas. And, uh, that's the infrastructure that Radical Trips is really helping us support. From this uh, prize pool, you have going uh, things going into the impact splitters for that specific prize pool, and then it goes to different uh, treatment vaults. Now, down here, it's cut off because we're going to look at this one over here to see how it works, but the system that I'm about to go through would apply here as well. Okay, so up here, we had people interested in public goods, pouring money at the top of the system, pouring water into the system, and then it's flowing through pro, uh, proportionally based on good decision-making by the DAO at the top, and also a medical prize committee for a specific impact splitter for a specific disease class. These are the experts that are gonna help make this decision. This, you can imagine, is a gnosis safe. A gnosis safe that updates you know, that calls a specific function on um, the impact splitter contract. Cool. And the water, the capital is flowing all, all the way to this shares vault. Okay, so this shares vault is really the link between the investors who are uh, playing as participants in the capital markets to invest in the right sort of projects. So there is this uh, open source IP NFT. Right. This could be for a specific, this could be like, you know, exercising twice a day and drinking two glasses of matcha for, it could be as simple as that. But, and then the, if this proves that, the, you know, this improves this patient outcomes for a specific disease class, then this is a treatment protocol that works. And it's a, a natural remedy for a, a treatment that in many ways could be better than, uh, you know, the philosophy of keeping people sick within the pharma world and stuck on your little dispenser of drugs that the health insurers will pay for. So uh, this open source IP NFT is this, is this purple box is the same NFT. Okay. It's just going through different States over here. And uh, this, the, what we're hoping is that the underlying implementation of this is a hyper cert. So we want to subclass the hyper cert and enhance it with certain functionality. So at the beginning, you, you know, you have proposed 
then you have like approved and you have completed for the state of randomized controlled trials. This is sort of like a, this is sort of like how in the hypersearch spec being currently developed by Raid Guild, you have a prospective and then a in progress and then a retroactive. So it maps very cleanly to that. Uh, we also have an evaluation NFT, right? So there's the evaluation NFT that's coming into the HyperServe framework that's linked to the open source IP NFT. Um, I have to admit there's some things wrong with your dev specs that I'd like to comment on. That uh, uh, there's, there's a little missing. This link doesn't really exist in the way you think it does uh, in the chart, but that can be easily fixed. Okay, so there's these shares for this open source IP and NFT, right? And there's different ways to create these shares. There's so many ERC-20 launch pads projects out there. And so you can use Syndicate, you can use Juicebox, you can use Molecule, Molecule is creating the platform for these as well, for people to um, mint shares for something specific. And these shares are the fractionalization of this open source IP and NFT. These shares get deposited into the shares vault, to receive a vault token. And this vault token acts like a tradable bond. So this vault token at any time can be burned and redeemed for a pro rata share of whatever is accumulated in this vault. You can hold the vault token until maturity and then you just, you've just made all the money. Or you can sell it earlier to somebody else who wants a claim on those future cash flows. So this is where the markets can, the investors can A, you know, invest in something that's innovative and B, have the option for uh, liquidity, which can de-risk their investment if they know that, okay, here is something that's a claim on future cash flows. If I want to exit this beforehand, there's, there's a way for me. I'm not stuck holding on to this thing. And so this is where I want to look at the multi-sig. There's probably going to be a multi-sig that's shared by a researcher and their investors. And they fractionalize their open source IP and FD, right? They raise funds for it. Let's say they raise $2 million. They've also submitted this, uh, they've also, when, when they created this actually, um, this goes into like an inbox for the medical prize committee to review. The medical prize committee can review and approve the treatment protocol and say, okay, we've taken an initial look at what you're proposing. This seems like it's on point. Now you're clear to go uh, and, and we're going to you know, consider you, you just have to go perform the randomized control trials. Great. So now the state on this, the hypothesis is still unproven, but the randomized controlled trials is approved. All right, now it's approved. Now that it's approved, the multi-sig, uh, the multi-sig for the research investors knows that they can then go fund the randomized controlled trials. They can go fund them and pay a contract research organization. These folks require like two million dollars to go and run the randomized controlled trials with the protocol you performed and it. Standard way in a world class way, so that we can have the right data to legitimize the protocol. And this contract research organization then creates an evaluation NFT where they include uh, the published clinical trial data and assign a certain amount of impact points based on the improvement in patient outcomes. The creation of this evaluation NFT then informs the medical prize committee to update the hypothesis and set the state to complete it on the hypersurf, on the, on the open source IP NFT. So the, we have this, the ch this checks and balances going on where our medical experts review the randomized control trial data and then actually update the hypersurf to reflect that. Cool. They then take a look at the impact points that were assigned and then go and update the open longevity impact splitter to make sure that, okay, this vaults gets six impact points, it gets five, it gets three, whatever, whatever makes sense in that point in time, it gets six. And they will continuously monitor this. Um, they, will have, they will have a protocol for monitoring this, reviewing things every year, for example, so that, and, and the, there could be this agreement where um, once you get assigned impact points, you're going to stay on for five years, for example. So there's different, there's different um, financial uh, creativity that we can apply to a situation. And so that really uh, wraps it up for this stage. There's a capital flow system of pipes with different agents. 
affecting system state at key points. It's permissionlessly extensible and other people can come start streaming funds into it. It is fiscally responsible because it ensures it tries to ensure this continuous funding over multiple year time scales with these 20% flow adjustments going on. We let the DAO, we get let we let general people inform us with what's important to them, but then we let the medical experts and the contract re research organization and the research and the researcher do do the good work and decide okay like this is the right place to put money the investors we engage with because now they have this source this incentive right they can get outcome payments for their investment that's the principal challenge with molecule if you guys have taken a look at molecule um any times lately you know, check out their marketplace they have 250 research projects listed right and when you load their page and the ipfs gateway works um you'll find that the four projects that have been funded have all been funded by vita dao and then there's a bunch of other projects that are trying to come online and it's not clear that they, any of them have raised any money and why would they if an investor is coming into this thing, like, what's the point? Unless they have a really clear, you know, connection, maybe they're, uh, you know, some some record scientist in biology who became mega rich and now as a patron of like his field wants to go and finance one of these. Okay, great, that works. But there's no nothing at the end of this system. That's why down here we have Molecule, we have Vita Dow, right, funding this. We have other mechanisms for potential funding, but there's this market failure happening, right? And that's where our system is a great way to allocate capital, only pay for success, only pay for valid um, improve, improvements in patient outcomes and uh, create the, uh, this is like a pull system, right? Pull the capital from the investors to invest into the right systems, into the right product treatment protocols and uh, you know, figure out the risk there. Investors are great at evaluating risk. Medical medical experts, maybe not so much on a financial financial lens. And uh, through the system, we you, we rely on best-in-class infrastructure like radical drips and this upcoming hypersert framework, which uh, having spoken with Kolka, he's super excited to be uh, working with us on like a V1 here and to make sure that what uh, how hyperserts shape up to be can support this real-world use case. So, yeah. Happy to talk to any folks about this. Anyone wants to collab, we're pretty open.